This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. So this is a wonderful day uh, each year, love it. I'm so glad it's going to be recorded. It's a little sad because some of our people are seniors and are going to be going away, so this is saying goodbye too, but we'll save that for the end and just uh, start by introducing each of the readers. Um, Yvonne Acosta, uh, we asked them to provide a, a small biography, grew up in the Los Angeles area She's on the editing staff of the Berkeley Poetry Review, which we said is on sale. Her work has been published in past issues of Clam Magazine and the Berkeley Poetry Review. She's going to graduate this spring with an English degree and a minor in creative writing. Please welcome Yvonne. Thank you. A Child's Window. The blanched out Santa Anas rival the mind as much as anything. At 6 a.m., the dumpsters are collecting their bottles in hurricane weather, and each elicits a response. The meat of language reaches for my woman tongue and plops. It's just another thick fat to get through, sinuous and choleric. Is this why no one shows their teeth? Daddy turns his face. A Christmas photo is much too fast. A wedding of wind to salt and paper to wind loosens in the streets. Remembering one thing over others, like a handmade coffee cup, and wood like Roman arches matching half smiles. One hush, and these windows can all be torn. Open, mother. Thank you. Thank you, wonderful poem. Sinuous and choleric is terrific. Going first reminds me, I was reading The Three Billy Goats Gruff to my youngest child who was you know, sitting there sucking his thumb. And at the end of, you know, the everybody remember the little billy goat goes across and the troll says, who's that going over my bridge? And he skips, the, anyway, my son popped his thumb out of his mouth and said, how come the little billy goat goes first? Which. <laughs> which I thought was a profound insight into the nature of reality. <laughs> Our next reader is Natasha Aurora. She teaches and writes poetry with June Jordan's Poetry and the People with June Jordan's, the um, June Jordan, Beloved in Memories, Poetry and the People. She's been trying to write a Sestina for about three years, so she asked if you have any tips, please let her know. Natasha, welcome her. Um, this is called, If What the Quantum Physicists Say is True. Somewhere there's another world where no love letters fly across the earthquake cracked border in Kashmir, where Gandhi snores late into morning rather than place foot in front of barefoot until he reaches salted ocean. Neruda forgoes his typewriter to sip another glass of Aconcagua Valley wine, and women tie apron strings elect Tuesday evening's dinner menu and leave the ballot boxes to their husbands, where the people never rally in the capital and yell long after tear gas spurts for salt water down their cheeks. If the physicists are right, somewhere is this world, where I rub open my eyes to newspaper obituaries and omissions, where I read what the physicists say. Every moment, a tidal wave of possibilities collapses. A quantum split cracks the universe and births this world with its bomb shelters and bread lines, while a quantum leap away the opposite occurs, which means somewhere, somewhere is a world where border patrol helicopters flying over San Diego desert drop cool-skinned tangerines into a hundred sun-scorched palms, 
White phosphorus morphs into a wisp of sandalwood incense smoke, and nuclear bomb builders switch off their lab equipment, prop their feet up and snooze all day, where garment workers stroke their lover's hair with unarthritic hands, and Oscar Grant dashes up BART station stairwells behind someone he loves, his unbulleted abdomen shaking with laughter, while two women pause on city hall steps, the distance between their lips paper thin as their new marriage certificate. And across the street, a pharmacist passes the AIDS patient his pills without asking for more cash than he makes in a month. In this Iraq, the women pray in their unbombed mosque, white paint, paint glinting like the eyes of well-fed children in Gaza, skipping to school past olive trees and the absence of checkpoints. And in Tibet, the nuns have nothing to protest but gather in the street anyway, to chant in orange robes the color of their joy, because here the torturer's hand slams in midair, slams against a high-energy quantum wall, its tiny particles humming, no, not here, not in our world. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, our next reader is Joe Bush. He's a longtime volunteer for Lunch Poem Series. He's a professional woodworker who has uh, built a couple of pieces of furniture for the Morrison Room. Maybe you can point them out to us. Please welcome Joe. Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, they're over in the office over there, a couple of glass-enclosed bookcases and a desk. One kind of poem I like is where the poet takes an ancient myth and attempts to uh, reacquaint us with its relevance. So I'm going to give it my best shot. This is uh, the beginning of a longer piece. Icarus on the Towers. With the eye to the sun, eye against it, the eye retreats, the iris retracts, the sun multiplies. In the blink of an eye, leaping under the eyelid, burning there, from within and without, behind the dark and beyond, so that when we blink to chase the image out, as if it were a lash loosened off our brow and fallen in, the sun, as with a will, imprints itself Upon all that we see, a light so bright, we may as well be blind. He stands, head and shoulders above the crowd. He smiles, and with his smile, he shines. I recognize in his bright features signs of my own child. The beveled chin, full lips, high cheekbones polished by the light. He looks as my own boy must look now, out and over and fearfully down. Atop the world, the fear becomes how small we are, how minuscule our fences. Among our gods, our battles wage on grander scale for greater goods, or so we pray. Above the clouds, we find instead an uncontested calm, a disconcerting barrenness descended over all, water changed to rock. Nothing grown but grows on stone. Heaven's air is thin, his lips parched, his lungs starved. A constant doleful drumming at his temples drives him on, past the prostrate virgins, sifting through sands for shards of flesh. Gather your garments round, lest they see us holy men, for which their countenances harden into ice, and they pelt us with their stares. Mounting into regions hitherto a dream, the earth no longer sparkles green and blue, but is subsumed into cloud and clouds of ash. Tiny fissures underfoot dogged our ankles as we passed, coughing, smoking embers dancing in our path, until we reached this higher ground, and turning to look back, see upon the plains we left all the world a wound. 
rivers running sores, mountains merely scabs. We'll turn back here. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, our next reader is Joe Cadora. Uh, his work has been published in Southern Humanities Review, Penumbra, the Montserrat Review. In the past two years, he's won the Eisner Prize for Prose, the Julia Keith Shrout Short Story Prize, the Fibili Hoffer Essay Prize, and the Elizabeth Crothers Composition Prize. He's a senior English major. He's also been involved in a project of translating all of Rilke's new poems, the two volumes of them, into exactly the meters and rhyme schemes that Rilke wrote them in. And it's been a phenomenal thing watching him carry this off. As you can see, he's very gifted. Welcome, Joe Kadara. Thanks. I, I'm really impressed with Joe having memorized that whole thing. I, they said that the ancient Irish poets used to have to memorize enough verse to be able to recite for a day and a night, and that it's quite an achievement to be able to do something like that. Um, I got fascinated with these little roadside shrines that you see on highways in California, especially in the Central Valley. Um, this is called Roadside Shrines. What kind of saints do these places honor? with plastic roses and wax votives, a picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe. On this grassy trash-covered patch of shoulder, the cars fly by, trailing papers and leaves, past the spot where you stopped along the way. Perhaps that one was a master carpenter who traded in his hammer for a hoe, clearing a weed-choked lot for some Anglo who negotiated the price of his labor through the window as if picking up a whore on the hot pavement outside Home Depot. Maybe this one did my dishes, scrubbed the sink for the big party when I was at my wit's end. Or did she wheel your babies out to the park while hers sat home in the cramped room of a friend? Perhaps she vacuumed the office where we both work, though we only ever saw her from the back. Was that one for a mother, father, and child fleeing into Egypt from some new Herod? Or did they think they were crossing into Canaan? Except for these crosses, they are undocumented. But now their spirits have naturalized. The ghosts can never be sent back again. See how these lives are remembered here. Look at these descansos, these recumbent ones. Death flows swiftly on the asphalt river. Yet these shrines seem fixed as a map with pins. Wind blows, but the plastic petals seldom stir and the barbed wire fence is a crown full of thorns. Anima sola, this one reads, for one who died alone. And that one states Nasio 8875, but does not say how long she remained alive. Put your ear to the ground here. Can you tell? Can you hear the screaming of the tires, the moan of the living body trapped behind metal? Names on some, others nameless where they lie resting here as the red silk carnations flame against the silver barrier of the sky. And see how the Sagrado Corazon, the flaming bloody heart, has faded with many suns, how its candle had only burned halfway down. But we, don't we know after all just who they are? They are not the elves of some fairy tale who work and then vanish. By the shoulder you read their stories, lips pressed tight together, until your knees find the earth rank and whole, and your prayer rises with the breath of the highway. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Our next reader is Jeremy Graves. He's a senior undergraduate majoring in interdisciplinary studies. He's interned with Lunch Poems for three years. We're going to miss him. And he currently serves as the gallery manager for the Alphonse Berber Gallery on Bancroft Way. Has anybody here not been over to the Alphonse Berber Gallery yet? Maybe you'll say a word about it. Uh, and uh, in addition to being a poet, he is a pianist and an avid hiker. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. 
so a blurb about the, uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah, a blurb about the Alphonse Berber Gallery. It's a new uh, 7,000 square foot gallery on uh, Bancroft, just north, uh, just uh, east of uh, where Telegraph and Bancroft intersect. It's a lovely space, you should all check it out. So I'm going to read uh, two short poems today, well, maybe just one, I'll see. Um, this first one's called Milos Speaks. Um, Cheslav Milos, I think most of you probably know, he was a professor here for decades. I think he died in 2004. Um, in this poem, he's, he's resurrected for my purposes. Yeah. Milos Speaks. It is arrogant of you to summon me from the dead and commandeer my voice, but being dead, I cannot argue. What then shall you have me talk about? My usual themes? Questions of theology, rage against history, eros, logos, so forth as expected, dear necromancer of deficient imagination. But I can sympathize, for I too was once a heretic imprisoned in the house of mirrors, that is, the material world. Behind the craven face in every pane of glass, a glimmer from the platonic realm toward which I would lift a hand. Now your hand takes its place. You point this direction in longing, in accusation, as I once did. Perhaps I can offer you a few of the lesser truths one comes by on the other side of time. Not a third testament, just enough when spoken to conjure thunder or prompt an eclipse. Local omens merely. I am neither the trumpet-wielding angel, nor am I the fiery angel of the whirling sword. No words of mine can startle the species from its stupor, as you'd hoped. Wrapped in the peace of non-existence, I've grown reticent. You know I'm only your shadow, so who is there to be led into the light? Poetry is not the path out of Hades, my sweet musician. If it were, we would all be poets, wouldn't we? The living would drown beneath the numbers of the resurrected. No, to sing is to look back. To look back and after. To fall to your knees at the threshold. Feel the warmth of the sun across your front. Uh, this last poem is called uh, In the Coop. It's about candling an egg. I just learned about candling an egg. I didn't know you. That's, uh, I guess you hold a candle up to the egg and you can see if the yolk is uh, good or spoiled. So that's a little vignette in the coop. Grandpa cupped the egg to the flame, light filling his bifocals frames. He was explaining to me the art of candling. The specimen glowed in his hand. Leaning in, we glimpsed within the flawless shell how the molten yellow shone, veined as a delineation of the Mississippi basin. Scowling, he spat out his chaw. Ignorant of the sacred laws governing the order of egglers, I asked when it would hatch. He shrugged and merely tipped the egg in his hand. My lone planet toppled pole over pole into a swill pail and out of the universe. Boy, he said, ain't nothing worse than finding the bones of a chick melted into your skillet. Smoke filled my head at the thought of steel, encircling something akin to a fossil of Archaeopteryx, wings splayed stiff like the arms on the crucifix, hanging from his furrowed neck. God had drowned prehistory in a bucket. Thank you. Thank you. The other thing about the Alphas Berber Gallery is that it's a student-created real art gallery so that students on the campus can see, Dave? We have cards there. Th there are cards there that we'll tell you about. And, and also tries to figure out how to make artworks available to student budgets. So this, is, this will, my, Berkeley might be the place where the art gallery gets reinvented. So it's a great idea. Go in there and support them. I also want to say that you can, after you watch this um, uh, video of this reading, you can um, find the one of Cheslav Miłosz's last reading in this room, and you can compare Jeremy's conjuring of him to the <laughs> poet himself. 
Our next reader is Alani Hicks Bartlett. She's a student of Romance Languages and Literature Program and Medieval Studies with an emphasis on women's sexuality and gender studies. Primary interests include sexuality and violence in early modern Spanish theater, trauma, violence, and memory in Renaissance and modern lyric poetry, Baudelaire, and French film. Please welcome Alani. Are you here? I just have a very short poem to read that's part of a larger series of about 30 um, small little poems. Um, it's entitled Second Lament. Child, all the chances that you have to call these smooth white days are fouled by the winds. This is a velocity I cannot stall. Already, the golden coins in the battered bow promise you to other shores. My wintered mind scissors blindly in the dark. Child, in all the race, there is no one else like you. The fields are thick with flames and tendons. The three seeping wombs of my dull wives teem with viscid vermin. There will be no one else like you. O oh, Romans, Romans, where is our native land? The soldiers lie demented in the fields. Agony is the torment of their minds. The warm quilt in which your mother wrapped you lies tattered at my foot. Chilled pain comes with the failed harvest and my empty hands. I believe that this is winter. O oh war, O oh whip, O oh waves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alani. Uh, our next reader is Pamela Crayenbold. She's an undergraduate double major in rhetoric, rhetoric and IS interdisciplinary studies. She's a ballerina, a choreographer, a photographer, and of course a poet. She's published in the Berkeley Poetry Review. Please welcome Pamela. Hello. Um, I'm incapable of writing long poetry, so you're going to have a couple of short ones from me. Um, the first one is entitled, um, No Great Illusion. I am not what you think I am, said the dove to a man admiring him quietly. I am neither the bringer of peace nor a creature of goodness by any means. He turned his snowy back on the man and was gone before he could respond. I am not what you think I am, said the crow to a man wary of his presence. My family is honorable and proud, and where I fly, shadows fall away. The crow circled off slowly, holding the man in his gaze. I am not what you think I am, excuse me, I am not what I think I am, said the man to another man, hiding behind a glass of water. His companion looked at him, warped through the bottom of the glass. Yes, I know. The second one is um, called After Walter Benjamin. Um, as a rhetoric major, I read far too much Benjamin, and somehow he invaded my creative juices. So, I know presence when I see it. At the intersection of space time, I revolve like a door losing authenticity with each reproduction, and we revolve around the ritual function of every work of art around, finding our way around your insecurities, not so much mine, working on exhibition value as your aura diminishes, cult value gone, this photograph only diminishes our aura. I revolve around your aura. Thanks. Thanks, Pamela. I have to tell you that my wife, who's also a poet, was also invaded by Walter Benjamin. And when we were living in Berlin, she was reading the Benjamin Adorno letters. And she would say to me, let's go see the house where he lived. And so we would go as an afternoon outing. And that, but it turns out it was the Depression, and you could get a deal on a new apartment. Um, 
by signing up and going in. So it turned out B Benjamin moved about every month. For, so ev she'd read another set of the letters, and then she'd say, no, that's not his. We've got to go to the, I think we went to 17 Benjamin <laughs> apartments before we were through. Our next reader is Steve Lance. He's also a fourth year English major. This year he received the Yang, Rosenberg, Coolbrith, Cook, and Academy of American Poets prizes. That may constitute a grand slam. He's a keyboardist of the band Butterfly Bones and a curator of the Alphonse Berber Gallery reading series. Please welcome Steve. Um, this one, this is sort of an art history poem, which is kind of a, a jerky genre, a jerky genre rather. Um, but all you need to know is that Latatlin was like a wingsuit that Vladimir Tatlin built late in his career when he was sort of, the moment was past. At the end of the movie, it took on the shape of a bird, and so did the camera. We flew to a house where an old man kept several black cats. The monument would not be built because it had been pronounced structurally unsound. In these poems, the words are often composed figuratively to form a picture. Other words make a fig tree, the winged fig tree in the Louvre representing the genre. The coats were also cats, which I think was a joke. The pictures make a poem and dominate the staircase. Its right hand raised an epiphanic salute was discovered years later but never attached. Returning from the city, they surprised themselves with a new sophistication, a joke about old men and cats. He would tell it in the voice of Sir Walter Scott. He would tell it only his eldest son. Vladimir Tatlin waved from the glass revolving cylinder down to the crowd, all Petrograd watching in wonder. There are phrases for what this was. There are phrases for fig trees and phrases for the first October object. He built a flying machine with wings like Leonardo's and he strapped himself beneath it for a group of reporters. They took a lot of pictures, but so much had changed. It was 1932, and there was something pathetic in his boy's smile and his boy's dream of wings. Thank you. Phrases for the first October object would be a really good title for a poem, and if you don't steal it from him, I will. Our next reader is Ashley Listney. She's a third year English major with a focus on poetry and women's literature. She also writes a blog about music and women in the arts and is one of the editors for CLAM, the Cal Literary, uh, Literature and Arts magazine. Please welcome Ashley. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, okay. Um, I did write a Sestina. Um, and I'm going to read that today. It's called We Are Trees. It's taken me a while to see that we are not flowers, but trees. Our backward leaves fall off in spring, only yellowing after winter. Last summer, we forced ourselves to believe we only liked the feel of each other's branches. Drumming up our courage, our hearts waterlogged drums, beating in the time lapsed slow of our blossoming flowers. As the year folded into April, we discovered just how alike we are. Though our roots entwine, we can't help leaving each other behind. Some will against ours forces us off of each other, and caught in this wind, yellow fragments of our skins weave into footfall traffic, the yellow of our closeness oranging with sticky, deepening beats, drumming hearts sweating faster as we lay across each other, a force magnetic drawing in at our centers, ringed insides flowering outward into some bloomed thing that is like love left over. We are logs piled on top of each other. We like how deadened we've become. It makes it easier. Like patient kindling, we wait to be set fire to, our pages yellow in this dry heat. We read each other at arm's distance, but our leaves reveal the secret, being so caught on each other. These burrs, like drum beats we try to quiet, are still brown, muffled, obvious. We sweep them like flower petals into a cupped hand. We open a window and force them out, and they fall stories down more slowly than the force of gravity should require. At such a speed, too, 
You, like the impatient fingers of a child, pull away at my soft paper bark, flower petals plucked off and blown into breeze. You are wishing on yellow pieces of me like they are magic. And your branches drum against my bark, over time leaving carve marks in the shape of hearts. Or maybe the shape of leaves, because really, the bruises we forced into each other's skins are just mirror images. My eardrums still echo the sounds of your photosynthesis. I liken all that's happened to some sort of deforestation. I once was a yellow grove dense with moss and masses of flowers, and am now some fragrant shelter mortared of leaf veins and flower petals. But I'm forcing out from my remaining wood a yellow sap that proves we are both still alive as it drips against our entwined trunks, drum-like. Thank you. Thank you so much. As of next week, Matt Melnicki, a microbiologist, will be a doctor of philosophy. He's a two-time winner of the Rosenberg Prize for Lyric Poetry. The science and art duality, often scoffed at, should serve as an inspiration to all of the audience. You don't need, you needn't be a letter scholar to listen to the muse, Matt says. Please welcome him. Hi. Uh, Let's consider this a test. Brahms stands. Facing draining demands, he is rounder. Still grand and profound, touching through the envelope the swivel of circumstance, the joyful revival of trampled grass. Those who at dusk tremble keep courtesy, if able, to color and adorn their dress in a lugubrious but grandiose semblance. All accolades come crinkled, forlorn from imperfection. All accents are imbued with the inkling of a dark direction. Even with even hacks can a phrase attack kind schemes. Mounting interpretations tend to bleakly transcend any easy dreams. My friend, refrain from filling the tale of spells with clapping. Please feel the heat your heart is flapping. Thank you. They clapped anyway. <laughs> Our next reader, Gillian Osborne, is from upstate New York. She's a second year PhD student in the English department where she studies American literature and poetics. Last year, she read in the Holloway Poetry Series and participated this fall in a radio program designed and directed by Cecil Giscombe's graduate poetry workshop. Long ago, a poem of hers appeared in Three Penny Review, handsome place to publish. Please welcome Gillian. Thank you. It's Jillian, actually, but with a G. Um, I'm going to read two poems from a series of four, and the four poems are called Cloud, Fence, River, and Bridge. So I think I'm going to read Cloud and River. Cloud. Oh, Cloud, you are thundering but not giving water. I am the Chetaka bird who is afflicted with thirst. If by luck the southern wind blows here, where will you be, where will I be, and where will be the shower? Sanskrit proverb. I wandered lonely as a cloud. William Wordsworth. Fine then. Fog, lavish the valley. I'll believe nothings, ghosts on a grander scale. Wending in obfuscation, expecting clarity clear as thunder, lightning, hail, fissure or tenderness. I'll leave a bucket in the window if you'll be a light rain. River. 
This man swims rivers. The other men follow him, dumping buckets of blood to keep the teethy fish from his flesh. His heart is in critical condition at the end of one river, which has nothing to do with romance, but is a physiological place the self swims through on its way toward death. This is not morbid, but a fierce and honest factoid. He swims wandering rivers and crooked rivers and long rivers, though all rivers are long if they are indeed rivers and not something else becoming a river. If I were a river, would you swim in me, I asked. Yes, you said, but you are not a river. This man has accomplished the Kirker, the Danube, the Yangtze. I don't know why. I'm writing you a letter that is electronic, but does that mean it isn't a letter? Dear, dear, I say to you, or in a style as if it were speaking. Did you see the messengers of God? These are the dear, scruffy, and sacred eating tourist biscuits outside the temple. We do not dwell by a river, and other bodies of water resemble us not, beginning, end. A lake is not in a front. We live beside a long and circuitous lake. Thank you. Thanks, Jillian. Our next reader is Tara Phillips. She began her studies at Santa Rosa Community College and transferred to Berkeley last fall. She's currently an intern at Lunch Poems and Story Hour. She began writing love poetry when she was a teenager. Welcome her. Uh, is it, I was just think, trying to think, is there anybody here who didn't begin writing love poetry when they were a teenager? Welcome. Flowers for the dead. I heard the dead can't enjoy flowers anymore. Nevertheless, folks pile them up at funerals, a little here, a little there, inside the casket where they propped up her breasts. God knows how, they never look like that in life. And there were flowers on the stage when the teen duo sang in their sweet, high Christian voices that made us cry. There were roses, lilies, carnations, and green sprigs. Like a homecoming, your besties wore red lips and toted their scrapbooks to a reception where they served bad chicken pasta that no one could eat. I missed you then. Wish you could have been there. You should have seen the flowers. You should have heard the Ave Maria. You would have liked the red hearse and the rich black everyone wore. And when the bell tolled and they lowered you down and we all threw roses into your grave, it just seemed right that their sweet weight would go down with you and mix in some living with the dead. On a lighter note, um, <laughs> okay, here's a couple short ones. I was thinking that I'd prefer a different life, one in which I was more female, udders extended, squeezing a milk road into the future, at times full of beer, full of wine to bursting, enough of me to go around two and one half times. Hello, you, good morning, you there, man, woman, child. I do unfold and surrender my breast before you, my most delicious person. Drink and be happy, I say. I grow merrier with use. Okay, and uh, another short one as well. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Lady, make it right, anoint me. The buds that are eyes tell of your craving to bloom and give me sweet fruit, one in a hundred seasons nectar. Uncoil those stars for eyes, lady. Show me the ethereal strands belonging to the spider and the moon. Tiny feet taut on a string make it bend under the heel, curving up to your moon, the eye that is swollen now, orange, inflamed with lust for a suckle of the human drum, my sex, a lazy rhythm, a twisted path, fleck with blood, and I will walk, arms out like knotted sticks, through a fulgence, a thin wall luminous bubble, and into desire. Thank you so much. Johanneton, is that how you say your name? Johanneton Sella is an undergraduate at Berkeley, of course. He's planning to major in math and minor in creative writing. He lived in Israel for most of his childhood. Please welcome him. Sleepwalking. 
Did you see the sailor set out to sea this morning, passionate in his glorious voyage and afraid? The fickle romance of thunder draws so many men to sea. In passing, he pressed his finger to the sculptor, whispered farewell, and stepped on board. Feeling quite white today, I walk the streets with a guava in my hand. It smells terrible. The firefly flies in circles over my head. The streets are empty. Only the water from the morning rain is flowing into the sewage. Listen to the doll fans hum. My father will marry me to a man I don't know. My mother bakes plum pies and shakes the carpets of dust. In my dream, my grandmother gave me a clay pot and told me to give it to the emperor in his tree. I cannot find the emperor in his tree. It is not a route you can find by searching. The rain fell to his hand this morning when he opened the window and called, what a fine day for sailing. Did they tie their hearts to the mast? Swish, swash, swish, swash. The four guards sleep with their guns on their laps to hear the call of the unimaginable. Thank you. Thank you. Our last reader is Legia Shia. Sia? X C I Shia. Legia, you're here. S -s pronounced Shia. She was born in Beijing and grew up in San Francisco's Polk Gulch. She enjoys salted caramel ice cream from Byright Creamery <laughs> and corn pizza from the cheese board. She would like to thank the Robert and Colleen Haas Scholars Program and Leah Carroll and Jeffrey G. O'Brien for their support. Please welcome Legia. Hi, everyone. Um, just want to say for sure that Byright makes the best ice cream in the Bay Area, for sure. You should go there. Um, I'm going to read two really short poems. She said, you only like me for my looks, for my money, for my apartment, because you like my family, for my t because you want me to work on your website, for one reason, because you're attracted to exotic women and things you can't have. The artist chose a mobile phone number to show that God was available anywhere and any time. What if you go to the park and you see that not only are there more people, in groups of two or more, but there are more groups than individuals. I'm not able to speak to you at the moment, but please leave a message. It could happen to you. It reminds me of my time as a waiter, a period as long or longer than any other, feeling sorry for people eating alone, giving them free side orders. A mirror hung in good light will always attract women. Suppose I was drawn by the crowds, slant strokes toward memorial object, to first record effects of time, look for me again as a flame with the door open, distracted throughout the film by my hair out of place. I remember my body regularly in flags and pushed by children. In the van with the door open, I called you again and again. In the view from upstage of you holding up the book we each printed, I understood the mind of the crowds. If I stood on the higher platform, I was on hand for betrothal. Trying to enjoy myself means peered under my skirt. The point was to invite you to my decoration ceremony. For reasons told us, there was nothing to see and no way to leave. To make a state understand, I enjoy the shooting salute. Thank you. Thanks, Legia. Strong voices and strong work. It was really wonderful. Um, first, would all the graduating seniors 
who read among our readers to stand up so we can celebrate you and say goodbye to you. And, and all the other readers as well now, thank you so much. Thank you all for coming.